دكتور علي رضا اسوسييت ريسيرشر يونيفرسيتي اوف كوتينغن جيرماني ابزيرفينغ ذا امام نون فيربال تيتشينغ ان امام هادي يس ويلكم تو ذا ستيج Ali Rada, PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Göttingen in Germany, 2021. Lebanese German scholar based in Germany. Currently, he is an affiliated researcher at the University of Göttingen, previously graduated from the American University of Beirut. Uh, he is a specialist, a specialist in the intellectual and social history of Shia Islam, focusing on uh, fiqh, hadith, and theology. He has worked in various research projects on education, thought, in classical Islam. Uh, and uh, he, among his publications, uh, avoiding unjust ru uh, rules in imami ethical discourse, insights on imam learning at the turn of the 4th to 10th century. Okay, Dr. Ali, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the generous introduction. Just let me set this. Yeah. So, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in this brief communication, it's my aim to explore some Imami Hadith reports from one part particular perspective. Namely, how a relatively large number of Hadith texts depict the Imams as teachers and the conversation with their followers as an educational encounter. Several thoughts can be derived from such an approach, but to narrow the scope of the paper, I will focus on those texts that consist of what can be termed nonverbal teaching of the Imams. Let me start with a concrete example. Hamad ibn Isa al-Juhani al-Basri, a companion of the sixth, seventh, and eighth Imams, reports in a hadith preserved in many imami compilations how he was asked by the imam if he had learned the right way of performing prayers. Ya Hamad, tuhsinu an tusalli. Hamad replied in affirmation, adding that he memorizes the book of Hariz ibn Abdullah on Salat. Al-Imam al-Sadiq wished nevertheless to put Hamad's knowledge to testing. He asked him to perform an exemplary prayer, qum fasalli. Surprisingly, the Imam was not satisfied with Hamad's performance, which brought shame to Hamad, as he states, فَأَصَابَنِي فِي نَفْسِ الظُّلْ The Imam then showed Hamad the proper way of performing prayers. The disciple transmitted the actions of the Imam, and the information is preserved in one of the most iconic traditions on this topic. The report of Hamad is a long one, and it's not my intention in this presentation to go over its fiqh details. What this research is concerned about is the educational aspect of this incident that was arguably not the only case where Hamad held the position of a student. In fact, one of his writings is titled Masail al-Tilmid, The Inquiries of the Disciple. <coughs> As an najashi reports, Hamad asked Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn Ali al-Sadiq these questions that are in the book, and the Imam answered him. The work as such is lost. We don't have the book. But it is a remarkable feature, cannot be missed. Hamad, regardless uh, of his scholarly status and merits, as one of the most informed companions of the Imams, conceptualizes his relationship with As-Sadiq in an educational context and depicts himself as a mere student of a disciple, of a, uh, of a master. This resonates perfectly with another tradition transmitted on the authority of Al-Imam As-Sadiq. We are those who know, and our Shia are those who learn. Now, reading Hamad's reports from an educational perspective, the following points deserve much attention. First, the Imams assumed in words and deeds the position of teachers and instructors. Their followers, too, admitted this role and understood that they stand in a learning relationship with a master of religious knowledge, not just a religious authority, as is the case with a caliph or a state official. That the Imams assumed this role is well established in the research on Imami Hadith. For instance, in an extended work on the contradiction in Hadith, Ikhtilaf al Hadith, Grand Ayatollah Sistani proposed a hermeneutical model that distinguishes between two styles of speech in the sayings of the Imams the juristic style, Uslub al Futya, and the teaching style, Uslub al Ta'lim. 
this crucial distinction helps in appreciating the encounters of imams with their disciples as moments of teaching and learning, in which the dynamics of, re of the relationship are slightly different. The compassionate, sympathetic, and caring persona of the imam meets the curious, eager, and inquiring soul of the disciple. Second, in this specific case, the imam does not examine the actions of, the, of a lay person, but one of the most learned of his followers. Third, the imam does not rectify the act of Hamad through a verbal teaching, not with words, at least as it, it is suggested by the hadith, but by actions. And as much as he wished that Hamad performs the prayers in front of him, the imam was inclined also to put the correct teaching in show and action. Fourth, Hamad's encounter with the imam bears the traces of a mode of teaching that is underestimated by researchers, namely the non-verbal teaching of the imams. The imams used to communicate their, their knowledge through speech, true, but also did not miss the relevance of showing their followers the correct conduct by mainly performing it in front of their eyes. Reversibly, the followers of the imams learned much information from such actions. Reporting the deeds of the imams is a well-known part of hadith corpus, and these actions were taken to be part of the sunnah that has an authoritative impact on deriving legal rulings. And these actions are themselves instances of non-verbal teaching, since the imam does not utter any spoken word. The probativity, hujjiyah, of such actions are dealt with by, non, by scholars of usul, who in fact invoke the description of such incidents as non-verbal legal arguments. Dalil al-shar'i ghayr al Moreover, hadith is loaded with non-verbal impressions, gestures, or body movements of the imams. The transmitters of hadith had arguably found that such information is helpful for conveying an implicit message that is much needed for a complete understanding. The conceptualization of the imam's teaching seen from the verbal and non-verbal duality in hadith is represented in the display chart, and I will be focusing on the left side, on the non-verbal teachings and the gestures. Examining these examples incite a number of research questions. Why do such pieces of information appear in hadith? In which way do they affect the verbal meaning? Why do transmitters keep such information? And do they differ in their interests? Did they keep all the observations? How do compilers of hadith gather this information and interpret it? How can we read such accounts from the point of view of modern linguistics? For example, with the speech act theory, pragmatics, stylistics, and other things. And just to give you an example how linguistic studies can inform such approaches, here is the results of Mehrabian in his classical study of nonverbal communication, where we see that nonverbal components constitute a major part of any message. Any message uh, has 55% of its con content in a nonverbal way, non non uh, uh, in actions. Starting first with the reports on imam's actions, example of such hadith bear linguistic uh, features employing verbs and expressions related to watching and observing on the part of the transmitter. The most recurrent one is, on, is the verb ra'aytu, I saw. As this example, again from Hamad. Hamad is reporting uh, a specific action done by al-imam al kafir as you can see, the imam does not speak any word. It's just that the imam went to, uh, to the Kaaba, did tawaf and prayer, and left. That's all. As stated, my question is, how can we understand this report beyond its legal authority, namely as an incident of nonverbal learning? Hamad here seems to be speaking for, for some audience, either in a learning environment where he is teaching them the correct actions of the imam, or in a polemical context where his testimony supports a certain ritual point. Be this as it may, we see, that we see that the imam does not utter any word. In this mode of teaching, it is rather the student's responsibility to gather the details of the action in question attentively. The learning process, in other words, relies on the disciple's initiative. He must have been attentive at the moment the imam performs certain action, and he must recall his observation later in specific and suitable context. One relevant point is that the imam seems to be aware, in some cases, of the fact that a companion or two are attentively watching his acts. And if we accept this, it can be said that the imams wished for such actions, in fact, to prompt questions on the part of their followers. 
Now we move to the second major component of nonverbal teachings of the Imams preserved in Imam Hadith, namely the gestures and signs of the Imams combined to their verbal teachings. This theme, this theme, as far as secondary literature is concerned, was first examined by the famous Orientalist uh, Ignaz Goldseer. In a primitive yet interesting short communication, he showed the relevance of this body language in understanding hadith reports attributed, attributed to the Prophet in Sunni collection. Several examples of hand gestures are included in Imami hadith collections. These nonverbal components serve various purposes according to the broader context of the report. Consider first this hadith. Zurara is recalling a certain legal ruling revealed by Al Imam al Baqir. It's about Adda, the, the uh, waiting period after temporary marriage. The Imam is saying that the waiting period is 45 days, but he, uh, I mean, the ruling includes a numeral information that Al Baqir displays visually with hands. He was aqada biyadai, as the, the text says. This, mo this method is called hisab al aqd. And basically, this, this is the method. Uh, it's a general hint um, on representing numbers with fingers according to this medieval method. It's no longer used. So, for example, when Al Imam Aqada Biyaday 45, so probably this, this is the gesture. Zurara was referring to this form. The Imam was doing 40 and 5. Yeah? This mode of visual representation is added to this hadith in remembering, he is remembering, to enhance the legal position it supports. Zurara not only heard the Imam providing the information, but also saw it. The Imam usage of his hand to show the legal information to his disciple is much telling on the way he helped them memorizing this particular position. Arguably, this additional helping method was taking recourse to since the topic is considered of certain relevance by the Imam. Moreover, the disciple, re-mentioning of the gesture in verbal terms to his own students is also instructive to his immediate entourage on two levels authenticating his testimony and passing the information further in the same way he received it once. Other significant cases show that mims and face impressions, for instance, are used to modify the verbal information or to condition it in some way or another. In this report about the Ba'ah Ahl al-Kitab, the Imam is giving a certain information yet with a remarkable face impression that caught the attention of the transmitter. So he's saying, yeah, you can consume this, but he's saying this like, yeah, you can consume. Yeah, that's the falawa yeah? shidqa. Uh, he twisted his jaw bone. Yeah, I took 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have uh, two minutes. I'll, I'll two take minutes two minutes. Sorry. I have two pages. Okay. Yeah? One way to understand the relevance of the facial impression recorded in the tradition is to read the, is to read the text without it. Try to read the text without this information. Had Bashir, the, the, the transmitter of this hadith, did not preserve the information that the Imam informed him with a twisted jawbone, the legal ruling supported by the tradition would be understood differently. But the transmitter is intentionally adding this part to make his reader aware of that there is something wrong in here. Yeah? Another example that I will not be uh, able to mention, but like for example here, it's about zakat, and we have the information, an incomplete information. The, the, the Imam Sadr is saying, do not pay zakat for every, and then he makes, he, he qala biyadihi, yeah, so it, it doesn't say anything. Yeah. I also skipped this one and jumped to the conclusions. I mean, uh, four main roles or features of this nonverbal teaching can be, uh, um, can be summarized here. First, these nonverbal teachings are explicative. They show the right performance. They are mixed with verbal communication for a clearer meaning. They are provocative. They intensify the educational encounter and render the disciple more attentive and prompt the learning process. They are replacive, totally or partially. They substitute verbal words, and in certain cases, the message cannot be understood without them. And finally, they are regulative in the sense that they signal the, in the intensity of the learning process. Here are some uh, secondary sources on this topic. There are a few. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for such uh, an interesting topic. Actually, nonverbal uh, teaching are very important because are going to be similar to a taqlid nowadays we are going to follow. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.